Okay, so we're ready to start. Okay, so we'll begin with three bows to the Buddha. One, two, three. And then with the salutation, Namo tasa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa. Okay, so now we come to a string of suttas which are concerned with the topic of karma. And all of the suttas are sort of built upon a common template or outline, but they elaborate upon that outline in somewhat different ways. So we're going to skip over the brief sutta and, that, and then just take the ones which elaborate, the ones which treat the topic in detail. And so the sutta begins with the Buddha proclaiming that there are four kinds of karma which have been declared by him. And this is an important phrase, after I realize them for myself with direct knowledge. Bhante, can you make the screen a bit bigger, please? Yeah. Thank yeah, you. Thank you. Okay. This is okay now? It's better. Oops. How about now? Okay, the important phrase here is that, and I'll paste it in. So it says, Maya Sayang Abhinya Sachi Katva Pavedi Tani. So the important thing he's saying that he explains these four kinds of karma on the basis of his own personal realization that he's realized through Abhinya. Abhinya means a higher kind of knowledge. And so sometimes it's said that the Buddha adopted, this is by some people say the Buddha adopted the idea of karma and different realms of existence because this was the common Indian intellectual background. And so the Buddha was speaking just in, to conform with the Indian sort of cultural understanding. But the phrase that's used here underscores the fact that this is something seen and realized by the Buddha himself. And we have an account of this on the in this traditional narrative of the Buddha's attainment of enlightenment, which we find in the a number of suttas in the Majjhima Nikaya, number four, number 19, number 36, and so on, where the Buddha speaks about on that night of his enlightenment, he passed through the three higher knowledges. So the first was the knowledge of his own past abodes, his own past lives. And then the second was the divine eye by which he could see living beings, sentient beings passing away and taking rebirth in accordance with their karma. And he saw that those who committed transgressions by way of body, speech, or thought would be reborn in lower states of existence in realms of misery, whereas those who 
behave properly, who behaved in ethical ways by body, speech, and mind, were reborn in higher states of existence, in states of pleasure, of bliss. And so this was something that the Buddha himself had seen and realized before himself. Of course, somebody might say, ah, the Buddha might have had visions of other realms of existence and had some preconception of the working of karma that influenced the way he interpreted these visions. If that's the case, you know, I have no way to dispute with that. But since we have trust in the Buddha as a properly enlightened one, out of, well, I would say out of my own faith and trust in the Buddha, I would say that this was a veridical, that's a truthful experience, not just a kind of mental fantasy, which was misinterpreted by the Buddha. If that were the case, we wouldn't call the Buddha the enlightened one, but the, <laughs> the benighted one, the deluded one, rather than the awakened one. Okay, so he speaks, he's going to speak now of four kinds of karma. And karma is understood here in the sense of deed or actions, activities. Okay, so what are the four? So first we have the brief teaching. This is this just as sort of, this is like the outline of the teaching. So we have dark karma with dark result, bright karma with bright result, then karma that's neither dark nor bright and has a result that's neither dark nor bright. And then the fourth is karma that's neither dark nor bright and has a result that's neither dark nor bright. And this the Buddha further describes as the karma that leads to the destruction of karma, or that leads to the ending of karma. I'll paste in the Pali for that. So it leads to kaya. Kaya is the wearing away. Yeah, destruction maybe is a bit too forceful of a term, but kaya refers more to like the process, like if there's a puddle of water, which is under the sunlight and then the water evaporates. So maybe we can call this the evaporation of karma or the elimination of karma. Okay, so that's the, layout of the outline. Now the Buddha is going to explicate what is meant by each of these expressions. Okay, so first we come to the dark karma with dark result. Okay, so here we have somebody performs an afflictive bodily volitional activity an afflictive verbal volitional activity, an afflictive mental volitional activity. And so the terms in the Pali just for the bodily action is subhya pajang, kaya sankharang. Yeah, so several of these terms are quite interesting. So the word that's translated as volitional activity is sankhara. And the word sankara occurs in a major role in the formula for dependent origination, where we have avijja pacheya sankara, that conditioned by ignorance, there are these sankaras. And so here we have sankara elaborated as kaya sankara. This would be volitional activity of the body. And it's described as afflictive. That is the karma, some kind of activity that causes affliction, distress or harm, either for oneself or for others. And so we have bodily volitional activity, verbal uh, afflictive, verbal volitional activity, 
and then afflictive mental volitional activity. And then as a, as a consequence of this, that person is reborn in an afflictive world. First, we'll go through the whole passage, then I'll elaborate. When he's or she is reborn in the afflictive world, then afflictive contacts touch that person. So the person undergoes afflictive encounters, encounters that cause suffering and distress. And then being touched by these afflictive contacts, the person feels, experiences afflictive feelings, feelings that cause suffering and distress. And these feelings are said to be exclusively painful. And the example is given of the case of the beings in the hell realms, the hell beings. Oh, okay. I give up. Okay. Okay, there it is. Okay, so the feelings are a kanta, which is exclusively dukkha, painful, or suffering. And then the example is given of beings in the hell realms. And maybe I have to say a little bit here about the Buddhist cosmos. So Buddhism divides the universe of sentient beings into multiple realms of existence. And do you see the table of Buddha's cosmology that I just pasted in? And so we have different realms of existence and the lowest are the hell realms. And then we have three other realms, which are realms of intense suffering, the animal realm, of course, there's some pleasure in the animal realm. For, for example, pet cats and dogs can have very comfortable existences, but most animals live with a lot of constant fear, distress. And then when there's conflict, uh, or uh, tormented by hunger, thirst, constant need to acquire food, then the pretas, the hungry ghosts have tormented by hunger and thirst. So these are the beings of the woeful plane of extreme suffering. And then we have realms in which there's mixed pleasure and suffering, which we'll come to later. So the lowest realm, the realm of intense suffering are the hell realms. And people sometimes question, you know, are these terms like the hells and the heavens, are they just metaphors. In fact, so, there are some Buddhist teachers who interpret them or explain them simply as metaphors for the extreme suffering of human beings or those who are in states of great fortune. That is said to be the rebirth in the heavenly realms. But I don't think, the, if you look at the Buddhist texts, honestly, they're not using these words metaphorically, but they're referring to actual, concrete, genuine, realms of existence, realms into which beings are reborn and in which they experience the results of the karma that they created in previous existences. So the only realms that we could see with our normal vision are human beings and the animal realm. But for those who develop the divine eye kind of supervision that opens up through deep meditative absorption, the other planes of existence, if one directs one's attention to them, these other planes of existence can become visible. Just to use an analogy for this, 
if it's like if you look at the spectrum of electromagnetic radiation, we with our human vision can see only a very narrow range within that band of electromagnetic radiation. We don't see the infrared rays, we don't see ultraviolet rays, and yet we know through other means that these bands or these levels of electric electromagnetic radiation exist. And so scientists are able to determine, yes, there are infrared rays, there are X-rays, there are gamma rays, there are ultraviolet rays, though we don't see them, they're not visible to us. And so these other realms of existence exist or they're laid out along that spectrum of planes of sentient existence. And though we don't see them, but if we, de de if we develop the spiritual scientific instrument, that is the divine eye, and then we direct our attention to those realms, then they will become visible. So it is said, I don't have direct experience of this myself. Okay, so in these planes that are described as the hell realms, the beings are constantly subject to afflictive feelings, extremely painful feelings, until that karma, the karma, all karma is finite in its effect. So when that dark karma precipitates its results, at some point the karma will become exhausted, and then the beings in hell will pass away from hell and presumably come back into the human realm. Okay, then we come to bright karma with bright result. And here we have a case of somebody who performs volitional activities, non-afflictive volitional activities, whether of body, of speech, or of mind. We have a note on this. So what is meant by here are the 10 courses of wholesome karma along with the volitional activity involved in the jhana attainments. So this is non-afflictive volitional activity. And as a consequence, this person is reborn in a non-afflictive world, a world in which there is no, let's see, at least no coarse types of affliction. There can be maybe subtle levels of affliction, but not coarse levels of affliction. So when one is reborn in such a world, non-afflictive contacts touch one, and then being touched by non-afflictive contacts, one feels non-afflictive feelings and then these feelings are described as exclusively pleasant, extremely pleasant feelings, as in the case of the devas of refulgent glory. Let's get the Pali here. So the feelings are akanta sukang. So we have a type of deity, a type of God called Subakina. So Kina is a little bit obscure. Suba here is translated as glory or could also be translated as beauty. And to see what is meant by this, again, we go to the chart of the Buddha's cosmology. Let me remove this and increase the size. How is the visibility? Bhante, can you make your screen, you know, the screen that yeah, you're on, uh, uh, just a yeah. bit larger? That would I, be great. Okay, if I make full. Is oh, that that's better? fantastic. Yeah. Okay, okay that's much so, better. Thank okay, you. So we're moving up now the scale of the Buddha's cosmology. So we see the human realm now above the human realm. There are six realms which are in the, in the desire realm. 
But these are the heavenly realms, the heavens of the desire realm or the sense fear realm. You don't have to go through a description of all of them, but these realms, life there is much longer than in the human realm, much more pleasant, but still the beings in this realm are still beset by sensual desire. But above the sense fear plane is a plane of existence that corresponds to the jhanic attainments. So we have three, three realms corresponding to the first jhana, three to the second jhana, three to the third jhana, and the number corresponding to the fourth jhana. Now the third jhana as a human attainment is characterized by extremely potent blissful feelings. It's the highest, supposed to be the highest degree of blissful feelings available to human beings. And those who master the third jhana will be reborn in one of the planes corresponding to the third jhana. Here we have aura rather than glory, but it's the same term. So we have the realm of minor aura, of infinite or immeasurable aura, and the realms of refulgent aura or refulgent glory. So the sutta that we're reading mentions as the, maybe the highest level of extreme pleasure, extreme bliss, the realm of refulgent glory or refulgent aura, the subakina, devaloka in which a lifespan here is said to be 64 great aeons. And an aeon corresponds to the period starting with a big bang, the full expansion of the cosmos, then the contraction of the cosmos ending in the big crunch. That is one great aeon and 64 of those would be 64 such periods. Okay, so that is the result, but to achieve that level, to be reborn in the devas of refulgent glory, one would need the non-volitional, especially the non-afflictive volitional activity of the highest level. So that would be the attainment of the, and mastery over the third jhana to an extraordinarily high degree. Of course, if one attains lower degrees of jhana, one will be reborn in lower realms, which are still extremely, maybe exclusively pleasant. And even if one doesn't attain the jhanas, but one just performs a lot of wholesome karma as a human being through practice of generosity, ethical discipline, maybe developing at a non-jhanic level qualities like the four Brahma Viharas, that would be generating very pure non-afflictive karmic formations, which could lead to rebirth in realms which are exclusively or extremely pleasant. Maybe not as blissful as the realm of refulgent glory, but still very blissful. Okay, then we come to the third possibility, third alternative mentioned. And this is a karma that's a mixture of the dark and bright, dark and bright karma with dark and bright results. And so the the Buddha goes on to elaborate where somebody performs volitional activities that are both afflictive and non-afflictive, whether by way of body, speech, or mind. And as a result, the person is reborn in a world or a realm that is both afflictive and non-afflictive. When reborn in such a world, the person is contacted or touched by contacts that are both afflictive and non-afflictive, and then being touched by such contacts, 
the person experiences feelings that are both afflictive and non-afflictive. That is, there's a mingling, a mixture of pleasure and pain. And then the case is given of, especially of human beings, some devas, and some beings in the lower worlds. So if we look at our table again. So we have some beings in the human world. I mentioned even the, in the animal realm, like if I've seen pet dogs, pet cats that get whatever food they need every day, they get a nice meal. They never have to struggle to find their food. They have a nice, bed. If they get sick, the owner will take them to the vet for medical care. You know, they have even, in terms, surely of hedonic quality, they have a much more comfortable type of existence than, sad to say, than probably at least half the human population, where we have wars, famines, um, oppressive governments, tyranny, and so on. Okay, then we have probably in some of the lower deva worlds, also there'll be a mixture of pleasure and pain. Now, what I find interesting, and before we come to the fourth alternative, uh, one thing uh, first, before I go on, one question that's come to my mind is, what is meant by volitional activities that are both afflictive and non-afflictive? And the way this is explained in the commentary, it will explain that the commentary explains sometimes the person performs wholesome karma, sometimes the person will perform unwholesome karma. And so they perform a mixture in the course of their life of wholesome deeds and unwholesome deeds. And that is why it's said that they perform a volitional activity that's both afflictive and non-afflictive. But I've wondered whether this expression used in the sutta could be interpreted more literally to mean that there are some deeds that are just not exclusively either wholesome or unwholesome, but the deed itself by its very nature has from looked at from one angle, it could be considered good, looked at from another angle can be considered unwholesome or bad. And just to give one example of this, I'll use the paradigm case often cited in moral arguments of a person. This is a person in Germany during the time when the Nazis arise who tells a lie to the Gestapo. Is it the Gestapo or the SS in order to protect Jewish families who are in a hiding place. So looked at from the angle, one angle of the principle that one should not tell a lie, you could say that the deed is afflictive or unwholesome because it breaks a general moral rule, but looked at from the angle of the intention or purpose of the action, it is non-afflictive, wholesome or good because the purpose is to protect human life and to protect people from being brutally either imprisoned, tormented, or killed. Yeah, so that's just a, a question that I haven't been able to find settled anywhere. But an interesting thought occurred to me when I looked at the sutta is that we could see here, maybe I need a Word document to make this explicit. That we could see here in a compressed form, parts of the formula for dependent origination. And so we have the volitional activity. So remember the Pali word that's used is Sankara.
Okay, then as a result of Sankara, one is reborn in a particular world. Okay, then within that world, contacts, contact the person. So we have contact. And then through that contact, we have feelings. We have feeling. Let me increase the size. Do you see the word file? Yes, Bhante, we can see it. Okay. Okay, now when one is reborn in a particular world, what does existence in a world actually amount to? Sort of when you look at it through the lens of the Dhamma, sort of in conventional terms, we say that a person is reborn in a particular world, but what does it mean to exist in a particular world? How does one exist in a particular world? One exists through the interplay of consciousness and what is called name and form or the material and mental factors of experience. So that is what is meant to be reborn in a particular world. And then once name and form arises, in order for contact to take place, one needs the sense faculties. So this would be equivalent to the six. The six sense bases. So we could see in the sutta describing the rebirth process, sort of implicit is the formula, at least a number of factors in the formula of dependent origination. So it's through our sankharas of volitional activities that we're reborn in a particular world, which means that consciousness gets established in a particular realm of existence. And along with consciousness comes nama rupa, name and form. So these two are in the constant interplay. And then emerging out of name and form come the sense faculties through which we engage with the world, the realm in which we're, we've been reborn. So the six sense bases. And then through the impact of objects on the six sense bases, we undergo contact and that contact brings forth Vedana or feeling. Okay, so now we've covered the first three alternatives. And now the fourth alternative mentioned here is the one which is quite maybe unique to this particular group of suttas and a little bit from the usual understanding of karma, it's something of an innovation by the Buddha. So this is karma that's neither dark nor bright and has a result that's neither dark nor bright, but it's the karma that leads to the destruction of karma. And this is the, here it's said to be the volition to abandon each of the other three types of karma to abandon the dark karma with dark result, the bright karma with bright result, and to abandon the mixed karma with mixed result. So that is the fourth type of karma. And let's see the note here. Yeah, the, no, the commentary explains that this is the volition of the path leading to the end of the round. That's the round of birth and death, the round of samsara. And that is actually supported by 
maybe we look at the other suttas quickly, then I'll take the questions. Of course, the other ones are just elaborations on this. Okay, so now we move to sutta number yeah, we move to sutta number 235. So here we have the explanation, what is meant by the dark karma with dark result. So it's the transgression of the five precepts, taking life, stealing, sexual misconduct, speaking falsely, and indulging in intoxicants. And actually, I, I have to say my personal opinion, just indulging intoxicants itself is not really generating strong dark karma leading to a dark result. So if somebody occasionally drinks some wine or some beer, it's not going to lead to a, on, its, on its own to a rebirth <laughs> in hell. But the reason that's included is because people who habitually use intoxicants, the moral sense gets weakened. The voice of hiri and otapa, the, the voice of conscience, and when the voice of conscience is weakened, then they can engage in one of these stronger types of unwholesome karma. Okay, so the bright karma with bright result is abstaining from transgression of the five precepts. And then the mixed karma is just explained in the same way. And then, then the karma with dark and bright, the karma that's neither dark nor bright is also explained in the same way. So we don't get the elaboration of this fourth alternative here, but we will get it a little further down. Okay, number 236. This seems a little puzzling to me that it explains dark karma with dark results by way of what are called the five major transgressions, that is taking one's mother's life, taking the, one's father's life, killing an arahant, maliciously injuring the Buddha so that he sheds blood, and then with evil intent, causing a schism in the Sangha. But the bright karma with bright result is explained by way of observing the 10 courses of wholesome karma. So it seems to me that certainly it's true that these five transgressions would be dark karma with dark result. But since bright karma is explained as observing the 10 courses of wholesome action, it would seem to me that the dark karma with dark results should be acting in ways of violating the 10 courses of wholesome karma. Or in other words, engaging in the 10 courses of unwholesome karma, taking life, stealing, sexual misconduct, false speech, divisive speech, harsh speech, idle chatter, then having strong covetousness, having a mind of ill will, and holding to a pernicious wrong view. Okay, the third and fourth alternatives explained in the same way. But here is where we have the explanation of the fourth alternative. So what is the karma that's neither dark nor bright with neither dark nor bright result? So this will turn out to be the eight factors of the noble eightfold path. So it's right view, right intention, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort right mindfulness and right concentration. So number 237 explains this fourth alternative by way of the eight factors of the noble eightfold path. And then number 238 gives a different explanation, but not entirely. So the karma that's neither dark nor bright is the karma generated in developing the seven factors of enlightenment. So developing the factors of mindfulness, investigation of dharmas, the factor of energy, of joy or rapture, tranquility, 
samadhi or concentration and the factor of equanimity. Yes, yeah, so those are the four kinds of karma. And now what should be said is that when you are practicing the factors of the Noble Eightfold Path or developing the factors, the seven factors of enlightenment, certainly on their own, those practices will be generating bright karma with bright result. So if one doesn't succeed in reaching the levels of insight realization that actually start to dismantle the causes of samsaric transmigration, still by undertaking these practices, one will be generating bright karma with bright result, bright karma that will bring rebirth into good realms of existence, either back into the human realm or into the deva realms or even into the brahma realms where one can pick up one's practice, resume one's practice and continue to cultivate until one reaches the world transcending path. But the intention, the purpose of practicing the Noble Eightfold Path or developing the seven factors of enlightenment is not to, to be reborn in blissful realms of existence. But the purpose of these practices is to dismantle the process of samsaric transmigration, to debilitate, to incapacitate the underlying driving dynamics of samsaric migration, of migration from life to life. And so the ultimate purpose of practicing the eight factors of the Noble Eightfold Path is to generate the right knowledge, the wisdom of insight or the wisdom of the path that de dismantles the defilements that sustain samsaric becoming. And then to realize the right liberation liberation from the round. And the same with the seven factors of enlightenment. So when these seven factors of enlightenment are all brought into being, all generated and then working together in concert, then they will chip away at the underlying ignorance and the other defilements that maintain samsaric becoming and bring liberation from the round. And that is the result that's neither dark nor bright. But don't think that um, when you're practicing like right view, right intention, right speech, right action, and so on, that you don't have to be afraid that uh, if I don't make it this life, I'm not going to have a good opportunity in the next life. And therefore I should give up these practices and just do things like practice generosity or do devotional rituals and do worship and veneration in order to get some bright result in the next existence. Okay, so maybe now we can see if we have any questions based on this exposition. Okay, the first I see is from Tim. Uh, Bonte, I, I may be extrapolating too much, but it, it seems that the implication is you know, Buddha was a you know, human being, that the, the human plane is the plane where we are, don't have enough suffering to sort of lock us up where we can't practice, yeah. but it's a motivator. We have enough unpleasantness where it motivates us yeah, motivate exactly, yeah, yeah. to develop. What, could you comment on that? Yeah, well, that is why it's said that um, the human realm is the realm in which Buddhas always arise in the human realm. 
and from a particular perspective, maybe from the perspective of liberation, the human realm is especially desirable or the most desirable because it has a mixture of pleasure and pain. So enough pleasure or at least enough comfortable circumstances so that one can undertake the practice of the past, the practice of the Buddha's past, but enough suffering so that one doesn't slip into heedlessness, complacency, and become sort of tied down to one's attachment to the pleasures of this realm. So that is said to be the drawback in the, well, also the human realm has a balance between, let's say stability and impermanence. So the impermanence means that the lifespan in the human realm is not excessively long so that we don't lose sight of the fact that we are mortal beings bound to die. And yet it has enough stability so that the lifespan is long enough, at least if we are going to live the full lifespan, so that we can devote ourselves to uh, the, the, the practice of the Buddha's past. Whereas in contrast, it said that existence in some of the deva realms, the higher de deva realms, because they are extremely blissful with very little or even no felt experience of suffering. And because the lifespan there is extremely long, so the devas easily get pulled down by negligence, heedlessness, complacency. Yeah, so that is the point. Okay, we go on now to Neil, you, Neil Dingman. Hi, Bonte. Hi. Um, quick, uh, I actually have kind of a twofold question. Um, oh. One is um, in the jhanas, when the, in the Buddha Sutra, where uh, Buddha is going to these different masters of his day and getting going through these attainments, what which uh, shramana tradition were those two teachers? I wasn't able to find those because yeah, I was interested in the context of that. And then when I noticed with the diagram that you had, you had a list of the deva realms, you had different male deities. And I was wondering what if there was a point where um, in Buddha and his teachers, the teachings, did he incorporate references to the mother, the, the mother goddess deities at all? <laughs> uh, okay, let's take the two questions in turn. As for the two teachers under whom the Buddha trained before his enlightenment, Alara Kalama <clears throat> and Udaka Ramaputta. Um, there's not enough information to, um, to situate them against the background of the systems of Indian philosophy that, that we know today were prevalent during that time. Mm -hmm. So there's some speculation that they were teachers maybe within the Sank, there was a system of Indian philosophy called Sankhya, okay. which is actually the philosophical basis for the yoga system of Patanjali, whose okay. system is laid out in the yoga sutras, but we don't really know for sure. Okay. Okay, then in the Deva realms, in the sense sphere Deva realms, there are um, sexual distinctions in the devas, the Chatu Maharajika, this is the realm of the four great kings, mm -hmm. the Tavatingza, Yama, Tusita. There are distinctions here between male and female devas, and they have a way of reproducing, but not through the ordinary, ordinarily, ordinary bodily sexual intercourse, the way humans reproduce, but rather, I think it said that they just when they fall in love, then they just look at each other with eyes of affection. And in that way they give birth. And then the female deity doesn't bear an embryo in her womb, <laughs> but the deva just springs into being spontaneously. 
but I don't remember the details about <laughs> birth in the Deva realm. <laughs> okay, I was I was curious if there was like a political thing going on. I, I feel like early Buddhism there was a it was a reformation that was going on at that time. At least that was that's my impression, and I was wondering if there was, um, like like anti mother goddess movement within the early Buddhist movement because of maybe association with uh, Maya. Um. I don't rem I don't think that there's first that, that there's any talk about a mother goddess in Buddhism, though there, there are powerful female deities, but I think the mother goddess only would make sense within a context in which there's a conception of a creator deity. So mm -hmm. in this case, it would be a female creator deity rather than a male creator deity. Um, mm -hmm. But in the Buddhist suttas, Brahma, who is depicted actually in the Brahma world, that's above the Zen sphere realm. When we get to the Brahma sphere, then there's no more gender differentiation. So there's okay. no more sexual distinctions there. Okay. All right. Yeah. Well, well thank you. And oh, yeah, I think one time you asked about where we're calling from. I'm calling from uh, Minneapolis, Minnesota here. Okay. Yeah, that's interesting to know where people are situated. Thank you very much, Ponte. Yeah, a nice city, Minneapolis. Yeah, beautiful. <laughs> yeah. Okay, David, David Broughton. Bante. So I have a question about um, the the last kind type of karma that leads to the destruction of karma. Yeah. So uh, can you clarify that? Our, our, uh, you know, I understand that if we engage in right, you know, the Eightfold Path, we don't create any more karma. But do we actually create karma that destroys some of the bad karma that we've d created in the past? Can you? Am okay, I that's, being... that's an interesting question. First, I don't think the, the first thing you said was that when you are practicing the Eightfold Path, you don't create any karma. I think that's not quite true. What I would say is that when we're practicing in our day to day life, the factors of the Noble Eightfold Path. We're certainly creating wholesome karma. Like if right. I avoid lying, but I speak the truth, I avoid harsh speech, I speak gently, I abstain from killing, stealing, sexual misconduct. Instead, I promote, protect and preserve the life of others, protect the property of others. Certainly with those activities, I'm creating wholesome karma. Yes. Um, but now the question, do, does that wholesome karma actually obliterate unwholesome karma that we've created in the past? Here I have to sort of draw upon my rather rusty knowledge of some commentarial material. I think what it can do, it can prevent that karma from ripening uh. or it can create such conditions that if unwholesome karma ripens, when it does ripen, its impact will not be as severe as it would be if one didn't engage in wholesome activities, but instead continue to engage in unwholesome activities. Yeah, I remember now a sutta comes to mind. It's in the Anguttara Nikaya, the Book of Threes, it's the sutta on the lump of salt. So the simile is given of, we have a lump of salt, and if we put that lump of salt into a bowl of water, and then we have another lump of salt and we put it into a big bucket of water. So in the bowl of water, the water, if we taste it afterwards, the water will taste salty. So that is like somebody who has unwholesome karma from the past and then create, does some unwholesome deed in the present. So that unwholesome deed in the present will have a stronger negative impact because there's a kind of background of unwholesome karma from the past. Whereas we take the water from the big bucket in which we've put the lump of salt and we taste it and we hardly taste any salt at all. 
So that is like the karma from the, if one is doing a lot of wholesome deeds in the present, then that unwholesome deed from the past ripens, the impact will be relatively slight. Thank you, Bhante. That's uh, Sutta 100. So I'm going to look that up and yeah, thank you. Yeah, three is one, 100, yeah. Thank you. Okay, so now Heinz Dieter. Yeah, good morning, Bhante. Good morning. <clears throat> thank you for your teaching. Um, question about the third category uh, where we generate both dark and bright. Um, I, I It's not quite apparent to me that a single act um, could do both yeah. um, like the example you give you know we lie to the to the henchman yeah. or i i don't speak truthfully to the thug that comes up to me and says give me all your money when i have a pouch of money well hidden on my body yeah i don't need to be truthful to that person um, i think the overriding my understanding would be the overriding factor is my intention right yeah, yeah. um that would cancel out that would that's what that would the intention of helping somebody or of preserving myself would cancel out any transgressive aspect yeah of the, of the action yeah i would think so too i'm just saying that you know some might want to look at the actions from yeah the two point two points of view from a kind of formal an ethic based on formal conformity to rules and an ethic based on the intention but i remember if i remember rightly like immanuel kant the famous yeah it comes famous, from kant this thing yeah yeah kant held that one should you formulate the universal rule so if everybody told if you're an tempted to tell a lie and then you formulate the rule that if everybody told lies then society yeah. any kind of community would be impossible so therefore you draw the conclusion that lying under any circumstances is unwhole is immoral and so kant held that one should not tell a lie under any circumstances because it would be a violation of that universal rule but I don't agree with Kant about that. <laughs> well, and also there's his other teaching where he says the only unqualified good is the good intention. You know? um, hmm. and, and Socrates points out that you don't give a sword back to a person who just went mad. You know, um, you break the promise of returning it because there's an overriding. But okay. anyway, my other point was, so would it be more productive to think about the third category as a person who inconsistently practices, let's say, the five precepts? Um, you know, they still slip in a white lie uh, here and there, um, or even though they otherwise follow the precepts. Would that yeah, yeah, I, I think that's probably the more likely explanation. All right, thank you. Okay, um, next is... I'm not sure of the pronunciation, Koi, Koi. Yeah, uh, good morning, Bhante. Good morning. Um, how how, how is that pronounced? Koi, Koi, Kian Koi, Bun. Koi, I say Koi, Kian Bun. Okay. All right. Bhante, my question is about the neither dark nor bright karma. Yeah. Um, uh, Bhante explained that, or, or rather also the sutta explained that as like, whirlings walking the noble eightfold path or practicing yeah, yeah. the practice yeah. of enlightenment right yeah so would, would would neither dark nor bright karma also refer to the uh arahan's functional karma which is a kiriya karma that is action without effect uh, they are doing something neither dark nor bright and also there's no result there's neither not dark nor bright results it's just functional. Yeah, I'm not sure that that would be the case because, let me just get the poly back. Anyway, okay, we could just use the English. So it says karma 
that leads to the destruction or the elimination of karma. So the actions of, of a arhat, of course, they don't generate any karma at all. So you could say in that sense that they're dark, neither dark nor bright, but the actions, the arhat has already achieved the destruction of karma. But here the text is speaking about karma that leads to the destruction of karma. So that would be a course of action that dismantles the effectiveness of karma. And so we have the elaboration of this in the two suttas down below, the practice of the eight factors of the Noble Eightfold Path and the practice of the seven factors of enlightenment. So you could say maybe that the arhat is beyond these four alternatives. Okay, okay, that means uh, it's exclusively karma that leads to the destruction of karma and yeah. not the functional karma of arahant. Yeah, yeah, that's the way I would understand it. Okay, thank you. Okay, okay. now we'd have Vinyu. Yes, uh, good morning, Bhante. Good morning. Um, yeah, I have this question in regards to the um, consciousness and um, mentality and materiality. Um, I think in one of the your your articles that you you have written about the intricacy of the reciprocal conditionality between consciousness and nama rupa. Yeah. And also, you refer to the hidden vortex. Yeah. Uh, my question is this, is the karma actually inside the hidden vortex? And how does it, um, you know, how does one, could you give some guidance of how to go forward el eliminating some of the hidden vortex? Thank you. Yeah, what I call the hidden vortex, it's an expression that I picked up from, there was a Sri Lankan monk, Venerable K. Nyanananda, who coined that expression to, um, to describe the interplay of, it, this is in the some versions of the formula of dependent origination, which speak about the interdependence of consciousness and nama rupa, name and form. Yeah, but the way I see it in the formula for dependent origination, um, These two factors of the formula are showing the results of past karma. These are the products of past karma. So it's not the case. Of course, karma will be generated within this interplay of consciousness and name and form. But what generates the karma within the interplay of consciousness and name and form is one of the factors of name or nama is chaitana. Chaitana is what we translate as intention or volition. And so it's volition that generates new karma. But within the usual formula of dependent origination, what is creating the karma are the sankharas. Actually, sankhara and chaitana are roughly synonymous. So within the layout of the 12 factors, Sankara brings into being together consciousness together with name and form, Nama Rupa. And then these two consciousness and name and form are in constant interaction. And from that interaction of consciousness and name and form, one then generates new Sankaras And then those new sankharas have the potential to bring forth at the time of death to bring forth a new consciousness and name and form, which then will constitute the next existence. Yeah, I'll be dealing with it, dependent origination in more detail in my J July Russian talk, when I'm speaking to the Russian group, 
And of course, the people on this call are welcome to join that class. That will be July 16th. So I'll deal with in more detail with dependent origination then. OK, thank you, Ante. OK, so now we have Zhang Wa, Zhang Wa Chang. Yes, good morning, Bante. Good morning. Yeah, I have a continued question about dependent origination. Uh, you talk about contact and feeling. Yeah. What I have learned is this feeling must be a, a pleasant feeling, so that will lead to the uh, desire, then cra craving, and yeah. then attachment. So my question is for those being in the low realms. Yeah. Do they have feel the pleasant feeling, so that they attach to their realms? Um. I say that the beings in the lower realm, they want to experience pleasant feelings. And so that they'll, they will want to get out of that realm. Or maybe if they don't have any conception of different realms of existence, but all they want is to escape from the, from the painful feeling. That would be their driving motivation. Yeah, how could that, uh, that trend continue to the existence if they don't like it? Um, they still have some attachment to existence, even though they want to escape from the pain of that realm of existence, but they still have a strong, we call bhava tanha, the craving for existence. And when they pass, so when they come to the end of their life, say in a hell realm, then some other karma will become operative, which will determine their next existence. So that's how um, the beings in the hell realms can emerge from the hell back into the human realm when some wholesome karma from the past becomes operative. Okay, thank you, Bhante. Okay, we'll just try to get in two more questions and we'll have to stop. Okay, Julian in Montreal. Good morning, Bhante, can you hear me well? I could hear you, it's a little faint, but go, go on. Oh, I'm sorry, uh, let me uh, try something else then. Is this better? Oh yeah, that's much better. Yeah. All right, thank you. Um, a point and a, a question. Um, wouldn't a, a good example of um, an action that is uh, both bright and dark be, for instance, uh, having a child? Like when you have a child, you create a person that will suffer, cause suffering, but also be helpful and, and help uh, other people. Mm -hmm. It seems that maybe a lot of our of what we do can have this uh, this this character. So that mm -hmm. would be just a just an idea. Um, but uh, my question, my actual question, is on the so the term kama and the idea in English, at least of uh, volitional, suggests yeah. that we're talking about things that uh, that we do that we 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 generate. Yeah. Um, but we know, of course, in meditation that we have uh, these uh, adventitious uh, ideas that arise yeah. that are yeah. in some sense ours, but in some sense it's unclear. Yeah. Do these generate karma? And um, where's the, is there a, a frontier or not between these thoughts and uh, volitional thoughts, let's say, yeah. and, and just the cognitive activity in general? Yeah, that's a good question. And what I say, probably if you look at that from an Abhidhamma perspective, you would say that even those little sort of adventitious, unexpected thoughts, images um, that just spontaneously arise in meditation, one would say that they might create some karma, but it would be very, very slight. But I say more from a practical standpoint that they are unlikely to create significant karma. Of course, in the Sutta way of teaching, the significant examples of karma would be those which on the unwholesome side either impose, create some kind of affliction for oneself or for others, or which have a positive impact on oneself or others. And those little momentary thoughts that arise in meditation don't seem to have a very significant impact. Yeah, but still one has to be careful of them because sort of if enough of them, if they're say, say tending in the unwholesome direction and they get strung together, then they could build up a momentum which can then sort of redirect one's inner life. 
Yeah, but taken individually, I think they're not so significant. Okay, Thank as I said, that. yeah, we'll probably have time only for the one more question. So this would be your wrong. Kabanda, I think you may have already answered my question through answering Julian. Well, I'll ask it quickly. It's a two part question. Okay. First, are all activities volitional activities? Okay, let us take, uh, I'm just, suppose I'm just taking a walk around the road here. It's certainly volitional in that I have to use volition with each step. I have to have the intention to take each step. But I'd say that an action like that, activity like that is not creating any kind of significant karma. So it's a volitional activity that's not really creating karma in a loaded or significant sense. Okay, so I think you already answered my second question. My second question is, uh, do all volitional activities fall under any of the four, or one of the four categories we talked about? So evidently, your answer is not, because some actions may not create significant karma. Is that yeah, that's, yeah that, I say that speaking from the pragmatic sutta perspective, no. But, but you know, from the Abhidhamma perspective, where every which I don't really agree with so much, where every little thought, every little action is either wholesome or unwholesome and thereby generating, and thereby it generates comma. It just doesn't seem to me that if I'm taking a walk, walking through the garden here, that I'm creating unwholesome or wholesome karma, at least not in any significant way. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, there was just Shirosha. Did you have a question? We could, if it's a, an easy short one, I could take it. Yes, Banda, it was a short one. Um, I just had a question about beings in lower realms. Do yeah. they have the ability? Uh, so the karma keeping in, keeping them in those realms, does it have to run out for them to move out of those realms, or are they able to generate in some way or form some bright karma to I... help them in their path? I think, let me just check that chart for a moment. Yeah, it says that the lifespan of existence in those realms is indefinite. So it would seem that they don't have a fix, a lifespan that's fixed by the karma. Yeah, so yeah, I'm just not sure. Of, under what conditions they pass away. Perhaps in some cases they have to exhaust the full karmic, uh, the full result of the karma that they've generated in other ways, perhaps they could pass away without experiencing the full results of those karma. Okay, I think we'll have to end for the, for the day and we'll have a class again next week that will be June 25th. Okay, so let us end with the sharing of the merits. So I'll recite the verses for sharing the merits. Akasa ta chabumata deva naga mahitika punyanta nganamoditva chirangra kantu sasanam. Akasa ta chabumata deva naga mahitika Punyantang anumoditva chirangra kantu dei sinam. Akasa ta jabumata deva naga mahidika. Punyantang anumoditva chirangra kantu mang parang. Dukha pata chani dukha. Baya pata chani baya. Soka pata chani soka. Unto sabepi panino. May those in suffering be free from suffering. May those in fear be free from fear. May those in sorrow be free from sorrow. May all living beings also be thus. We go sadhu.
Okay, I'll sign off now. Thank you, Bhante. Bye. Okay, bye-bye.